Hello, everyone, and welcome to Africa Fire Mission's weekly virtual training session. My name is Mike. I'm a project coordinator with Africa Fire Mission. We're also happy that you took time out of your busy schedules to come and join us for today's virtual training session. Uh, today, we're joined again by Richard Gatina, who's going to be talking about uh, reducing uh, community risk uh, in fire prevention. Uh, before we get uh, started with today's training, I'm going to pass things over to Jose, who's Africa Fire Mission's uh, fire safety advocate, for a few words of encouragement. Thanks a lot, Chief Mike. Thanks, uh, Mr. Richard Gichina, for uh, showing up today. Uh, my name is Jose, for those who don't know me. And uh, sorry, I've been away for about five Wednesdays. I've been, I was doing my uh, firefighting examinations. Um, let's jump right in so that we we can go to today's very interesting uh, uh, topic. Um, I'll I'll jump in. Uh, I read the Bible often, and um, there's this verse that came into my head. Uh, I mean, that I was reading in Romans chapter five, verse three to five. Allow me to read, please, and um, uh, just go with. Uh, later on what uh, I'll, I'll communicate. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, yeah? Note out that says that, uh, and character produces hope, you know? We need to be hopeful. So why is hope important? Yeah? Hope reduces feelings of hopelessness, increases happiness in our bodies and our lives. It reduces stress and it improves the quality of life. Yeah. So today's encouragement is for you to be hopeful, is for you to find a, a meaning in your life. For example, you're in the fire service. You need to be hopeful so that uh, if a call comes, you're, you dress up very quickly and you develop in your mind techniques to go either fight the fire or either do a rescue or things like that, depending on what the call has been done, has been given to you. So in a nutshell, um, I would say, be hopeful and also so that you can increase your quality of life. Thank you for listening and uh, back to you, Chief Mike. Thank you, Jose. We always appreciate you coming and joining us, sharing those words of encouragement. And I would uh, encourage everyone to stick around after our training uh, for Tea Time. Ho Jose will be hosting Tea Time where we'll get to discuss today's lesson uh, or anything else that may be on your mind about the fire service in Africa. It's really a great time for some great learning and some great fellowship. So I encourage you all to stick around after that. Today's training should last uh, about an hour. We'll stop at the top of the hour. If you stick around for at least 70% of today's training, which is usually about 40 or 45 minutes, you will receive a certificate of attendance for today's training. Uh, if you get cut off or you don't have enough bundles to stay long enough, uh, keep your eye on the chat and I'll show you a, uh, a link to our Google Drive where you can get materials from today's class. You can watch a recording of today's lesson. Uh, and if you watch that recording, uh, answer a few questions, uh, you'll receive a certificate of attendance for that as well. Uh, I think that covers about all of our administrative things. So at this point in time, uh, I'm going to pass things over to Richard uh, to begin with today's lesson. Take it away, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's already afternoon here. Good morning, Mike. Uh, you doing, uh, Chief Mike. It's awesome to see you here. And... Uh, <clears throat> I really appreciate everyone who is uh, who showed up, and uh, welcome everyone. Hopefully, you're doing well. The week the week have been well from Wednesday till today. It's a whole one week uh, with a lot of uh, inspirations, with a lot of new challenges, with a lot of uh, up down. So welcome, Hula, to our to our lesson today. 
uh, feel free to ask a question maybe via the other uh, the chat. So you can also raise your hand and we will still really appreciate uh, everything uh, here. Hopefully this gets us a place or uh, um, some, somewhere from where we were before. Uh, today's lesson is um, very simple. It's current uh, research in reducing community fire risks. These, these here points that we talk about um, technology, uh, indications, uh, about the global warming, about everything. Today we are going to discuss uh, like completely uh, everything that we have uh, just in uh, details and uh, some something here and there. I know everyone has uh, has some inputs about the current situation on uh, and the dynamics of fire. Um, maybe fire tools and recruitment that they have in in their fire station that some of us, some of other fire stations doesn't have, and uh, such kind of things. So we we jump in. In uh, this, the breakdown. This, this is different. This is definitely what uh, uh, the lesson shall entail, which entails the five E's: engineering, emergency response, economic uh, initiative, education, and enforcement. So we, as the firefighters, we are a close the bond. There's no way we don't fit. We have uh, firefighters who always have. Uh, we, we can be able to implement new things. Uh, emergency response, we are the firefighters, we are the first responders on scene, and then we have the economic uh, initiative um, with our administrative uh, roles and times, we also contribute in that. Education is where we do community fire prevention, uh, we do community skills, we go to school, we go to churches, we go to the marketplace, and then we enforce. We always enforce when it comes to uh, the licensing, the what we call the trade licenses. If your department has that uh, provision or they have that policy that you can be able to investigate, and also you can be able to, in, uh, to, to give people direction and orders so that they can, be, they can reach on, uh, they can have what you call the licenses and we know that our community, uh, our latter goal in, um, uh, are safe. So we, we, you can find yourself in any of these positions. You might be engineering. You might. So we always find ourselves in one way or another in this, in this, um, in this time. So we understand about the community fire risks. Community fire risks. One thing is the potential dangers, the, haz the hazards that are affiliated with fire. Uh, if we look at this picture here. Uh, we can uh, we can be able to see sorry uh, we can be able to see like we have uh, a house and we know a community is made up of uh, many houses and uh, many families so in one thing we we'll look at it we'll see here here we have monitor space and uh, these are the spaces that we have we have uh, we have um, people we have with with offices in their houses. Then we have, you can see we have smoke alarms, we have uh, vents, we have cooker, we have the kitchen, we have the, the sitting the sitting room or whatever, what we call the living area. If, if you look at this, if, if, if you make sure like these dangers are eliminated or if you are not eliminated, uh, you have put a place and um, uh, you have put up, put up, put up measures that will help you to at least reduce the risk. So uh, we go, we move on. The list, these risks are devastating. Sometimes you find them; they have, uh, they can damage a life, they can damage properties. You can lose a life. You will get to a building, and then that building caught fire, and uh, the, the the occupants or the the members who are inside, they one of them, they lost one of them. Then fire, we know, damages things. If something is not fire redundant or fire proof, uh, it will definitely have to be damaged. Then the other thing is environmental degradation. Environmental degradation may uh, affect the entire environment, like what is happening. I know Chief Mike can bear witness about the California fires that always happen annually. 
we have these fires that happen in, happens in Australia. They always damage, and then we lose our firefighters, we lose property, we lose animals, and then the ground covering. So uh, when it rains, we have a lot of million and one tons of soil erosion happening in that in that place. Uh, if, if you can be able to see this, we have this part that affects the climatology. We have droughts, we have uh, glacier rates, outburst water, water dry fires, then we have fires. These are some of the things that we have. We, we have the natural things that happen in, uh, in our current, in, in our currents and they, they, they in the outlier. Then we continue, these, uh, we continue as a result. Uh, researches has been done, they have been conducted, and to some point it has proved like passing this information, passing these skills to the community, may it be in schools, uh, in chief barazas, uh, or what you call them, the chief uh, meetings, and then we have um, congregations like churches, uh, we have uh, community work, uh, health worker, workers who are meeting somewhere and then we share them this information. It is really, really, really act as as a, as a, as a mode of uh, reduction uh, because everything that happens. Remember what we said about um, at this chart. So we start with the, some of these programs that happens and they help in a reduction and uh, on, on, on fire risk. And also, it's one it's a it's a trending thing that is happening. Help. Prevention and uh, education program. We look at some guys, these guys here. Yeah, they are here training uh, people about um, uh, fires. They give them uh, maybe the, the frameable materials, they give you about the safe facade in all over the country. And the importance of having these smoke alarms and the fire, uh, fire extinguishers, fire blankets sand buckets in the area, there's so, so much more. So uh, this is uh, when you go to school base, these are the young generations. We say, if you want something to go, to spread out very fast, teach a, teach a child or teach a kid. Uh, now these, these are our main guy, uh, he's from South Metro. Uh, he's wearing something from South Metro, but he's in Kenya, he's in uh, He always, work in community workshops. He goes to Madare, goes to Nairobi town, he goes to most of the places, most of the firefighters have seen him in his action. He has been in Malawi for a very long time. He has been in Kenya for very long times and now they're trying to spread. Then what we are doing, online resources, online training is also part of this. Because with this sharing this case, we feel like everyone is um, involved, everyone is at, uh, at peace because you train them, you give them the skills and then we move ahead together. Uh, the other thing is it promotes fire safety, not it, uh, it promotes fire safety. Um, the knowledge and behavior changes of these programs can be significant use the current environment. I know Jose has been number one. I always refer to him because he has been the guy in uh, most of the times. You see him here. He's trying to teach people how to uh, extinguish fire from um, a burning cylinder. Because we have this cylinder, the 6 kg cylinders. I know it's a commonly used in homes. Actually, Mike, I don't know if you have some of these things in your places. Or you are this tap gas. No, we don't use them quite like that. Here in, uh, I think in Africa, we have mostly, it is mostly very, very viable. Most of the homes has them. So you find out in one place, like uh, the maker or the banner has some default. And then uh, some, you, we, have, we lost one of the, 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 the oh, I, I'm trying to remember that the guy's name um, is a husband to a, to a very a well-known person, a well-known person in our country. Uh, he was cooking and then the gas cylinder burst into frame and then he lifted the gas and moved it with it. So the frame came to him uh, with this type of things we're trying to reduce on uh, our current. Uh, the other thing that is happening and uh, it's, it's really, really touching on uh, 
on uh, researches, it's also really touching on technology, is the building designs. Uh, initially, we used to see buildings have been, have been built with uh, materials that have um, that, that, that really, really are susceptible to fire. So by the end of the day, with these new technologies, you always find them like things are happening and uh, we always have a way out. So building designs and building uh, techniques, they are very, very good in enhancing fire resistance. You see here, you look at this diagram on, uh, on your screen, we have a cell, we have uh, places, we have this. You look at this part, you see like this column is made of fireproof uh, materials. And then the other we, we continue, we also look at our fire resistant materials and combustible materials. We also have types of houses. We have a family house. If you look at a family house, it has uh, the gas cylinders, it has electricity connected to it. Uh, you know, it, now we can become, we, we try to advise guys if they have fire, uh, fire smoke detectors, heat detectors, um, escape routes in everything, in every building, in the office, we have them in the, in the factories. We need to have our fire extinguishers, we, have, we need to have hydrants, we need to have to make sure like these fire extinguishers are serviced the office does it have the exit signs are the exit to paveways are uh, correctly lighted or are they are they good are they visible and so on and so forth uh then the other thing is about uh, designs this is when we have this some build uh, we know sometimes back are uh, these most of the building did ha didn't have uh, the, the, the smart, what you call the smart uh, fire suppression technology or systems. The, uh, these are the sprinklers, automated sprinklers, um, uh, fire alarms that are connected to sprinklers, they are connected to smoke detectors, they are connected to heat detectors, and then they are also connected to silence. So this is something that has happened really, really and it's really saving a lot because if a building has uh, this system and the system are working correctly, they always, always raise the alarm before uh, the fires uh, 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 go to start uh, to more to fully develop the stage. Then uh, by the end of the day, we have building that the smoke, uh, what you call the fire alarms are connected directly to the fire systems. We have in these developed countries, in this developed world, we have such systems, like like when um, a building, uh, like what you have in the banks. Most of these banks that we see around, they have uh, the alarm system that is connected direct to the police lines. It's connected to direct police control units. So that if anything happens, with a switch of a with a, with a, with, a, with a switch on button or with a, just a punch of a button, the police are notified and they can be able to. Uh, to address the issues or the issue promptly. So these are some of the things that we are facing with the new with the new research. Uh, then the other thing is some of these are the firefighting equipment. We get very new, very new and very improved um, firefighting equipment. We have these more than the state of art uh, fire fire trucks that are coming with very very new things. They're coming with very, very advanced uh, machines. Like for example, the thermal, the thermal imager, a thermal imager camera can be able to detect heat on, on smoky, on, on, I can be able to detect some, some, some heat on a very smoky building. Uh, we have the gas detectors, which detect uh, hazardous gases. Uh, we have different, we have um, uh, fire trucks that can be, uh, that, that are driven by, Electricity. They are all, you can only you can charge the vehicle, and then it goes on, and uh, it does. See, some of them are connected with the uh, internet or the Wi-Fi. Then, by the end of the day, we always find like we have um, some other measures that that are happening. We have what you call the automated fire extinguishers. You can put them on generator rooms. You can put them on um, like. Um, a dangerous, uh, uh, most of the zones that are susceptible to, to, to a lot of heat, 
And then you put that uh, the automated uh, fire extinguisher to that point. We have smoke, uh, firefight, firefighting balls or fire extinguishing balls. Yeah. I think that always people are always and eventually coming up with new ideas. Then the other thing is about vegetation and um, environment. If uh, I, I know Chief Mike, maybe you can uh, assist us on this one. He, the fires that are happening in California, they, we see they, they are trying to make trenches, they're trying to make roads, wide roads that the fire cannot uh, pass or it cannot jump to the other section. Chief Mike. Yeah, you know, this is <clears throat> the diagram that you all are seeing there. Is, is part of our training that we do what we call, what we would call the wildland urban interface. Um, so you're looking at a diagram that uh, you use this, this in your planning purposes. And when, when communities are being built, um, you're building defensive space. So you can see there that there's, there's defensive space um, and you're moving those, uh, those uh, uh, vegetation and things that are close uh, to the home, you're clearing those out so that nothing's close up against it, collecting, you know, various woods and dried vegetation, you're creating that green space, you know, around it so that uh, if a bushfire moves through the area, um, that it'll pass around that defensible space that you've created. Uh, thank you, Chuck Mike. Uh, 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 there's people who always ask why a building is built with this, what you call the walk pavement. And why does, is it a must that this building must have that? The, the, it's, it has the reason behind it. Yeah, it's for, beautiful, it's for beauty, but also this part of we also, we also act as a fire barrier. Because when this grass gets, uh, catches fire, if the fire is uh, is moving towards the house without this barrier, it will be able to get contact. So, uh, when you have this, it acts as as a barrier. Then you look at the different. Uh, there is also a space between one tree to another tree, so that it will take, it will not it will, it, will, it will not spread. The fire won't spread so fast. We're going to see another picture. Yeah, here. We have what we call the fire stop. The four ways are fire stop. These are natural. These are the very natural. For example, you can have uh, a road in between the bushes. And uh, if, if, if someone has ever gone into uh, these big tea uh, uh, farms, tea plantations, sugarcane plantations, they always have segments divided with roads. And we always hear saying like, why do they make so many roads inside the, the plantation instead of one? And then the plantation is one as an idea. So this, this will act as fire bricks or fire barriers to prevent fire from uh, one point or one, or one portion to spread to the other portion. They always act as a buffer zone between the world and the community and, and also uh, one point or one uh, to another point. So uh, then when you're planning, and this is when we, we go to, when, when you go to other side of planning, in such a, this helps in creating these buffer zones. You, when you're doing a building, you have to look at the exit, the low, the, the provision for roads. Uh, then uh, you have to look at the, uh, the risk, and then you have to look at the, 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 the areas with a lot of risks you try to minimize as much ground covering as possible. Yeah, then the other thing, firefighting too, um, technology and technologies. These are techniques and technologies. Um, we have very new systems. Some uh, fire detection, like what we use, like what I, I received an email in my, in my, in my phone about a fire detection in one place, in, in a place in Kenya. And they, with the help of the satellite, you can be able to detect wandering fires way before they spread to uncontrollable opposition. So we have drones, uh, very automated drones that are supposed to watch on that. Uh, I saw uh, we have, I saw one uh, that uh, we have, I saw one in the California fire. It's trying to give 
um, the firefighter's direction on the wind and where the fire is uh, is heading to. And if, if, when it's still above there, it can be able to tell you where the fire is uh, more concentrated and where you can be able to send uh, you, the, the resources that you have. Uh, we also have uh, it's the, the technology that we have now, what we call the, the CAD or the computer aided dispatch, uh, it is very, very helpful because it can be able to, to, add, um, uh, to alert uh, several units. Like you see here, we have, we have the police, we have the ambulance, we have the firefighters, we have um, the, the helicopter, which is will act as an evacuation protocol or procedure. Is we hope the technology now currently is giving us as that room. Uh, if you look at places like uh, these developed countries, they have different units. We have the radar units, we have um, uh, the, the track, what you call the track units, we have the, the squads that are what you call the, also the rescue units. These units, it has been brought with the current research, with the current uh, technologies. Then community engagement and collaborations. Obviously, if you want to go far in terms of uh, development in a community, we have to engage as many parties as possible. We have to talk. We have to, to go into detail and uh, talk with the community so that we can get we can get stakeholders there, we can get uh, uh, sponsors there, we can share information from there. We can get, they are good in person sharing information on what is happening on their area, which areas are more vulnerable to fires, what happens here, they will give you everything. Okay. Then the other thing is you have to have um, neighborhood programs or work programs like uh, for fire firefighters who are volunteering to go and train the public. And then it also enhances um, what we call the bonding between the firefighters and also the community. It gives them uh, the feeling of belonging. They know that these firefighters belong to us and they are here to listen to us and they are here to help us, which also leads in um, more fires being prevented and uh, you have campaigns. Then you, then in case of any fire, you, your vehicles would be stoned as what happens in Kenya and most of the places. So if we, we, we do this, we include community, in, uh, we, we encourage them, we, we, we collaborate with them. They can give us a lot of information. And in summary, this is what we have learned uh, currently. Fire prevention is one of the things. Building designs, these are some of the things that are happening with the, the current situation. Vegetation management and land using protection. Firefighting and things are like blocks. Chief Mike, back to you. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> That's a great, uh, great review of, of sort of what's going on as we we, uh, uh, you notice that there's a theme that runs through a lot of what uh, Richard is saying here, and and a lot of that ties back to education and community education and the way that we can um, decrease that community risk um, is by educating them. Um, as we talked about the uh, the various types of uh, cooking gases that you use, you know, here in the U.S., um, our cooking gases um either are, are plumbed in on a supply line that comes um you know from the street uh, basically or if we're using uh, gas in in some form of a cylinder those are always kept outside uh and then there's plumbing that brings the gas into the home so you guys have to deal with the situation where a lot of people are bringing those gas containers inside you're cooking you know within within a meter or so of that of that gas container, which can increases a lot more risk to the community, especially in our settlements where we've got lots of densely packed homes side by side. So um, there are other means, of course, of cooking. Um, and in other areas of Africa, even the gas cooking isn't that popular. There's still a lot of use 
of charcoal and wood um, for cooking fires. Uh, in Kenya, um, the, something that, that may be presenting an opportunity for itself in this community risk reduction, um, I was just reading the other day that um, less than, uh, in some information from Kenya Power, less than 1% uh, of of people that that are connected to electricity uh, use electricity for cooking. So in Kenya, you've got less than 1% of the population using that for cooking. Whereas, uh, I don't know what the statistic is here for the US, but it's very high. It's, it's a very uh, common method. Uh, cooking with electric is a little bit safer. Um, in the US, it's actually swung to where um, cooking with electric is so common um, that some of some restaurants and 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 people who are really into cooking um, switch back to gas, uh, you know, for a little more control and to sort of cook these fancier meals, right? But but where you're at in Kenya, uh, to begin the process of switching over to using electric electricity for cooking, could be a great thing for community risk reduction. So how do we accomplish that? You know, there's where you try to take the opportunity to do what we would call a public-private partnership, uh, where you would partner with Kenya Power. You know, can you partner with Kenya Power or and 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 maybe some sort of distributors um, that that sell or produce your electric cooking devices? How can how can you all work together in order to to maybe reduce the cost to make it more cost effective. I know that's a concern. Some of the tariffs that you have on electricity uh, seem to be higher, you know, so uh, some different things that we can look at there to try to get um, to try to get that community risk reduction. I see in the chat um, that we've got a question um, about vegetation in fire prevention. Um, so I can kind of touch on that just briefly a little bit, but as we discussed in, in, in some of those slides, um, uh, we, we, we want to create some sort of defensible space around um, our living areas and or around our businesses or, or anything like that. So, you know, uh, right up close to the building, uh, we're looking to remove those types of vegetation, Richard spoke about, you know, uh, maybe a sidewalk area uh, around the building or some sort of a stone, maybe some stone around the building. We don't want to have decorative vegetation planted right next to us. Um, as we spread out and get further away from our buildings, uh, if you're choosing which type of vegetation to plant, we want to try to plant some sort of vegetation that stays nice and green and vibrant throughout the year. So um, if you're planting some type of a seasonal grass, that as the seasons change, the grass greens up and then uh, the grass dries out, uh, browns up uh, throughout part of the year, um, that would be, uh, that wouldn't be the best choice. We're looking for some sort of a, a vegetation that requires, you know, a small amount of, of, of moisture in order to stay green so that we've got that nice green space. Uh, if we have a bushfire moving through an area of dried vegetation, when it comes to an area where you've got green, vibrant vegetation, our fire activity, our, our, our flame lengths, all of that will drop and reduce. So those are areas where we can catch up to the fire. So if we have those, um, those defensible spaces, and it's not just vegetation, but it's other things, um, garbage and debris that sometimes uh, builds up along buildings that can also be used as a carrier of fire as fire moves either through a community um, of structures or or as it moves if we're talking about uh, a bushfire or something like that. So it's, it's all about removing those fuels, whatever they may be within those spaces close to our buildings uh, and, and close to homes. Uh, I see that we have a question here. Uh, Adelina, uh, you've got your hand raised there, sir. What can we uh, what can we answer for you? What do you have to add to our discussion? Uh, good, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, how sir. Yeah, how are you guys? I just Great. want um, 
to know some uh, something in rural areas in the rural areas how do you give how do you advocate fire prevention to the com to the rural area communities the residents uh, in, in 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 my concern is due to the fact that some sometimes the fire extinguishers are hardly to be found on them and then they are even hardly to get some of them they cannot afford fire extinguishers and then how do you advocate them because there's different methods because before you advocate maybe you have to check what do they have and what kind of, what kind of houses do they live in and everything how many communities are there and how do you choose what kind of uh, people you're going to use because some of them they're going to work during the day some of them they're not working during the day so what is your how do they choose who's going to uh, be taught on the fire prevention on that time when they are uh, available excellent question um and and really what what you need to to think about is that um in order to it doesn't cost us it doesn't really cost us anything to teach those fire prevention topics and as as a community um, you know, certainly it would be great if if every home in Africa had a fire extinguisher in it. Um, but we know that's not going to happen uh, here in the United States. Uh, every home does not have a fire extinguisher in it. Of course, it's recommended, you know, that you have a small fire extinguisher in the kitchen, but that's not uh, that's not common here in the U.S. Uh, as 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 you may think it would be. Um, uh, so there are other methods uh, of putting out the fire so we can we can teach lessons uh, about using a blanket to suppress a fire um, if you're talking about uh, those cooking with the gas fires um, Jose's got this this neat demonstration that he does right when you're uh, if you've got a if you've got fire coming out of the of the gas cylinder right that flame there's there's a space between the the burning flame uh and the outlet on the gas cylinder and you can you can sneak your finger into that little space uh and snuff that fire right out it's a it's a neat little trick and and i've i've seen jose uh, do that presentation and and the look on everyone's face, they they think that he's performed, he's doing some sort of a magic trick for them, right? Because you've got this big fire shooting out of your gas cylinder, and he just slips his finger in front of it, and and the fire's out. You shut off the valve, uh, and the fire's out. So uh, those are you know those are some some great techniques that you can teach. If you don't have fire extinguishers, it can be as simple as keeping a bucket with with some sand. Uh, or some soil in it um, that you can use to smother the fire if you have a kitchen fire. Um, you've, it, it, it's quite common to uh, to cook with an open fire and cooking oil, right? That's a demonstration that we teach. Um, we did it uh, in a couple of cities in Malawi when we were there in June, uh, you know, and that was a great demonstration where... Um, we we start a fire with whatever the locally available cooking sources. In that case, you know we're using charcoal, and we set a little uh, a, a pot um, uh, on the over top of the fire. We fill it with with cooking oil, and, and you know if that sits unattended uh, and the oil gets overheated, um, the oil eventually self ignites. You know, so we wait until that. Uh, that that cooking fire, that cooking oil has has self ignited, and we're doing this out in the market, uh, in front of the crowds, uh, and then we we take a take some water uh, with a cup attached to a stick, and we we dump some water into the uh, the pot of burning oil, and of course, as firefighters, we all know what happens when we dump all, uh, water into a, a a pot of 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 burning oil, right? We get this large um, you know, mushroom cloud of fire, right? We get this huge fire and, 
you know, and everyone in the crowd, ah, you know, and it's a great demonstration of why we won't, we don't want to throw water on a cooking fire. You know, if you did that in a small home, um, the entire kitchen area would be involved in fire. So um, it's a, it's a quick and easy demonstration, uh, relatively inexpensive um, to grab a little bit of, of cooking oil. Um, I, you know, I know that in, in some communities that, you know, we, you don't waste that cooking oil, right? But a demonstration like that to make sure everyone in the community understands. And then I'm sure that when we go out into the community and we do one of those demonstrations that, you know, throughout the, the coming week, you've got people talking to, to other people in their communities that weren't there. And I can't believe, you know, what I saw, uh, at the market the other day, the firefighters were out there and uh, they were showing us a cooking fire and what happens if you put oil, you know, water in a cooking oil fire. So, you know, that spreads. So, uh, and, and very inexpensive demonstration. Um, if you had a lot more time, you could do two of those side by side and dump water in one and in the other, dump some soil or, or dump some sand in that. Um, to show how it quickly snuffs it out. If, you, if you've got more time, or you've got a, a more attentive office, you have a little bit more of a resource there. Um, and all of those things reduce um, our community fire risk when we know those things. Um, and, and let's face it, like someone said in, in, in the chat there, in Kenya, you know, it's the electricity pricing is, 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 is keeping people from using that, you know. So how do we develop those partnerships where, uh, we can promote something different, um, you know, at, at some point in time, it, if less than 1% of people that are hooked up to electric are using it for cooking, and if it was more affordable, uh, more power would be consumed. Uh, more power being consumed means more money for the power company. So at a reduced rate, but selling more volume, you're still making money, right? So we talk about those different ways um, that, uh, you know, maybe if the cost of electricity was reduced by a little bit, you could encourage uh, more consumption. More consumption means more money. You're not necessarily losing uh, money in the deal. So uh, how do we develop those partnerships and things like that? What kind of target do we do in the rural areas? We're targeting everyone. We're talking everyone that has some sort of risk um, uh, just to, to keep your, your homes uh, the outside of your homes from you don't let let trash and garbage collect next to the building you don't let dried vegetation collect next to the building um, if you're if you're using a, a charcoal cooking fire are you taking are you moving the ashes out of the home at some point in time right if we're continually cooking in the same spot cooking in the same spot we've got a buildup of ashes um are we safely disposing of those ashes when we take them outside and dump them somewhere? Are we sure that it's out before we take those out of the home and dump them somewhere outside where it could catch the vegetation on fire? We still see that here in the U.S. Uh, from people that use coal for heat um, as they empty the, the, the cinders or the ash from a coal stove. You put that in a bucket. You can set that bucket out on the out on your front porch and leave that sit for a couple days uh, and the, the ashes will insulate themselves to where you can dump that out in the vegetation a couple days later and there may still be enough hot coals that it starts a fire. Um, so lots of education opportunities there to reduce that risk. Uh, Daniel, you know about, I, I contribute? Yes, please, Jose. I told your story. You should have been telling it. Yeah. No, it's all good. Uh, just to add on what you've said uh, in regards to Ad Mr. Adelino from South Africa, who's just mentioned, is uh, uh, how how can you be able to do that education? One of the things that uh, I've found that it is a success, especially in context, is uh, what I've uh, dubbed uh, a healthy home. Of course, with the permission of the people who are living in that house, you can carry, you can enter their home and and just do a frisk, uh, a walk through the house. It can be just one room, as that is their home. For example, um, in some communities here in Kenya, you find that yes, they cook with wood and the three stones, 
So what happens is that uh, they store the wood on top of where they are cooking. Yeah, the cooking is down here and then the wood that they are cooking is up here. And you find that uh, what Chief Mike has said in regards to the uh, pouring water into cooking liquid oil, uh, if it explodes, guess what happens? It will go and catch the, 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 the wood that has been stored up here. So you can devise and you can have a talk, a conversation with the owners of the house and tell them that they may need to think about the risks and uh, what they need to, uh, you need to tell them the why, the why, why to move this wood from up here and maybe store it either outside in the granary or somewhere else. Number two, what also you need to, to check again is, uh, as Adelino has said, the materials in the house. Yeah. So you need to tell them to declutter. You know, that's how I would do it in the rural areas. And even as Chief Mike has mentioned again, what medium are you going to advise them to use uh, to put out the fire? Don't advise them to go for the extinguishers. It's not even uh, economically viable for them, but they can use a uh, soil or sand, all right? That's a very good medium. Even till today, I actually, that's what I advocate for. Even in the uh, slum area that I usually go to every time, I just make a walk through and I'm like, hey, how, how are you guys doing? Are you stirring up your sand and uh, soil so that it doesn't kick? Or they go like, oh, we forgot about it. Let's cut it. They 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 stir it up so that it can be loose. So that if there's a danger, they just throw uh, it onto the fire. So um, it's all about thinking creatively and thinking for themselves, uh, uh, and helping them out. They're really stressed with the level of their life that they're living, but now it's your duty to break it down for them. Uh, so that they can be able to understand, even in our African context. Back to you, Chief Mike. Thank you, Jose. Uh, Daniel, uh, I saw you had your hand up, sir. If you'd like to unmute yourself, go ahead, sir. No, thank you so much, Chief Mike, and good afternoon. Good afternoon. And good afternoon, comrades. Yeah, I just want to make a comment on the topic. I think this is a very nice topic. Um, just the, um, concerned on the rural areas. For instance, here in Zambia, we have got a, a program like um, government has embarked, um, has uh, made a collaboration, what they call rural electrification authority, where they are connecting rural areas, those are uh, grass thatched houses. Find that maybe a square of maybe 10 by 10, it, it has got maybe three or four houses of um, first house. So in this regard, in terms of fire prevention, and the worst part is find that these um, areas are far away from the nearest uh, fire station. So what sort of fire prevention, apart from the said uh, um, uh, medium that you have presented, like soil, what? Now you're talking of thirst, uh, grass thirst homes. How do we handle such situations? Thank you. Daniel, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and and there's there's a, <clears throat> there's not really a, I don't have a great answer uh, for that, but um, it some again, we're going back to our advocacy. There's, there's the grass thatched roof, grass thatched roofs. Uh, boy, when fire gets into those, they move so much. They move so the fire moves so quickly through those. Uh, advocacy for the use of of different materials. The advocacy for um, trying to switch to like a tin material. Um, of course, those those aren't available. Um, advocacy to the local government to to advocate to them that. What type of uh, what type of programs can there be? Some sort of a government program. Look at the quality of life that we could improve for these people if we could help them to replace the grass thatched roof with a tin roof. You know, a tin roof. Uh, you can you can place burning embers on that tin roof, and you know it's it's not going to catch fire. Um, if that's if that's all that uh, if that's all the only option. If the only option is those 
those thatched grass roofs. Um, as you as you plan your community, are we putting those homes touching side by side so that there's there's no defensible space between there? Um, are we positioning? Um, you know, are we are we putting sort of on standby? Do we have maybe some buckets of dirt that we or soil or sand uh, as an extinguisher that we can use to? Um, sort of pre-position in there some sort of a shovel that's there with loose soil that if if we do get a fire and thatched roof you know we can we try to throw soil on it all those sort of ways to to try to to prevent it once it's happened um if anybody else has some ideas or some experience uh with that uh with dealing with those grass grass thatched um rubes uh i'd be really interested in hearing what else you guys have what kind of experiences you guys have mike just uh to add a little bit of what you're saying uh the best thing we can be able to do is try to advise the community or the person inside the family inside that house on what we call a health or hygienic house um, house planning so that also with the with the, with the fires and everything else, we can be able to tell them this this should not be here. Please put it somewhere else. Like we we sometimes back we used to have this uh, grass lush house and they were made of uh, oil. And then you will find them. Uh, they, they, you they put um they used to create uh the kitchen in uh, all the, the, the cooking area in some uh, in, in the central point instead of putting it closer to the wall you can tell them now the kitchen should be at least be at the central point where it you take more time for the frames and also the sparks to reach to to to, uh, to, to the roof mm -hmm. then the other thing is uh you advise them uh if there's something else they, if there is another alternative where they can be able to do but the best thing is on house plan hygiene. It is it always works. Then the other thing is we still have a very long way to advocate on such things because if you continue preaching the gospel about good housekeeping, good fire prevention skills, these things they will start thinking inside people's mind. So that now we can be able to so that from there now our job will be easier. Thank you. Anyone else with uh, with any uh, thoughts or recommendations uh, as you're dealing with these communities with the grass thatch? Go ahead, Adelino. No, uh, what uh, I think thatch roof is is, uh, is is it's a special and and dangerous uh, thing to build. So because in most cases, uh, if you don't have water on a thatch roof, you'll never be able to fight it with sand, because thatch roof bends from the inside of the all all the, all on those straws or thatches inside and it's it's a hidden fire because the moment that fire comes out it comes out faster so the only way to to fight the types of fire is to dismantle all those stages of the the roof that's the only way but by using water also so the most important thing is to have more community and using bucket system having have uh, have, have them build their own ladders or they can make a, um, a, a wooden ladder that they can be able to climb and then throw water whilst they are uh, dismantling all those straws just by having more, more community. So that's the only way to, to fight it. You cannot fight it, just throw water and then leave it like that because it's gonna burn in over time. So the only way is just to dismantle the whole house, rebuild again the whole thatch and rebuild. Or you can dismantle on the side that's burning and make sure that all the burned sides are dismantled. That's how it's always uh, been fought. 
Excellent. Excellent comments. Thank you for that. You know, and, and you're exactly right as, as that's densely packed uh, in there, you know, uh, you've got to try to do something to, to, to suppress those flames or to keep them from, uh, from, from spreading and jumping from, from home to home. Uh, excellent, uh, excellent uh, advice there offered. Stephen, uh, go ahead, sir. Hi, Mike. Hi, Tim. Um, just uh, to allude to what uh, Adeline was just saying and refer that to this uh, interesting topic. Yeah, when you're talking about fetch, uh, would take it that uh, remembering when we used to fire fight a uh, uh, the houses, there is no way you can think of salvaging. I I know we all believe that firefighters we must save property or try to salvage something, but when it comes to thatch, thatch just like what Adelino you just said, the truth of the matter when you're dealing with thatch, the thatch, the thatch. You just need to take it down, all down. That's the only way you can deal with it. And uh, maybe just to add on to other issues that uh, is, this topic is very crucial, is very broad, and it needs uh, more of our time. I, I, I think uh, it, it is more of us as firefighters we should take heed that this element of uh, community risk reduction it plays a vital role not in the rural areas but everywhere and uh, it has got very big topics that we can spend the whole day i, I thank you so much for this topic uh thank you so much Stephen. and you're right uh, we're up against our time here so at this point in time we're going to close the official part of our training for today, but I encourage you all to stick around. We're going to carry on this. Uh, we're going to carry on this discussion. But I want to thank Richard for uh, joining us today and leading our discussion on this topic. Thank you to Jose uh, for joining us with his words of encouragement. Uh, I encourage you all to uh, to to share with your fellow firefighters. Invite them uh, to join us uh, uh, again each week. We've got uh, plenty of room here. Uh, for everyone to participate, for everyone to attend. I uh, thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules, uh, and I hope to see you all again next week.